afternoon, everyone, and I am Kathleen Arnold Lewis, actually the former director of the chronic disease department or division within the Department of Health here in the territory of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to our USVI Walkability Institute webinar series, Improving Community Resilience with Sustainable Walkable Design. <clears throat> One of our objectives is, is to join the nation in the whole theme of the active people we will, would relate to a healthier nation. So if you look at your logos on the screen, on the left-hand side, you see there where we have active people, healthy nation. Um, I don't think it's any secret to any of us attending that physical activity has been one of the mundane, instrumental components of healthy living. So talking about walk Walkability Institute, um, it's actually so you could know a little bit, and Mark is going to go into this much deeper, but the Walkability Institute was formulated back in 2017. Um, it was a conglomerate of different entities from different agencies within the territory, as well as federal visitors. Um, Mark, our expert, has been instrumental, along with his team, CDC, and um, Tepanet, doing many, many, many wonderful things to collaborate with the USBI in making this Walkability Institute, Institute a reality. So the Department of Health in the territory leads the charge when it comes to health. In the territory, um, leaders in the areas for Department of Health, we have the areas of environmental health, epidemiology, community health. We have women, infants, and children, family planning, maternal child health services, communicable disease services, alcohol and drug dependency services, and behavioral health services. And they are constantly pushing towards a better, better health for the entire territory. So we're constantly partnering locally and federally with, with leaders, with personnel to implement interventions and put care services in place that would move our community into better health and wellness. So with that said, I am going to let Mark go and introduce the rest. But what I want to do is welcome you. I thank you for your participation <coughs> and thank you for your time um, spent here with our walkability. Institute presentation. It'll be fun. It's always fun, Kathleen. Always That's the fun. One thing I look forward to. Whenever I get to work with you guys, I end up wait, wait, with a smile. Wait, that is not. I, that is I, not I, always. Mark, one thing I want to say is we know that, and this is more serious, that chronic diseases have been a pain in our rear for a long time, and it is getting to where it is so critical that nobody goes untouched almost by a chronic disease, whether it's diabetes and the complications, losing limbs, whether it's um, people going on to dialysis because of kidney failure, whether it's vascular diseases like heart attacks or vascular disease related to stroke, there's a lot going on. Cancer, I, we can name many, many, many chronic diseases, but those are the top three in the territory. And we continue fervently to figure out ways to minimize and, and decrease the prevalence rates. Our prostate cancer rate is times four compared to the nation. So this is a call not only for activity, but to really look overall, how can we improve our communities? And this is one of the ways that we can definitely contribute to improving health and wellness in the territory. So listen to our projects. Yeah, thank you for that important reminder. I, and I'll add one piece that I'm, I'm getting from the Centers for Disease Control. I get to work with the CDC all over the country and they're reminding us now that as you look at the data from the pandemic, we're acknowledging that the people most likely to have adverse outcomes to COVID have one, of the, one or more of those comorbidities. So you're much greater risk um, for a bad outcome with COVID if you have cardiovascular disease risk factors, overweight, type two diabetes, um, uh, uh, hypocholesteremia. And, and here's what's interesting about that. It means that it, the best prescription I can give somebody, so if somebody says, well, what can I do before I get vaccinated? What can I do to reduce my risk? I can say, one, you should be physically active every day because we know it reduces your risk for all these cardiovascular diseases. Oh, and by the way, you should wash your hands, wear your face mask, social distancing, you know, whatever else you should be doing for proper behavior. But most importantly, you should also be being physically active 
because being cardiorespiratorily healthy right. reduces your risk for an adverse outcome. So it helps us with chronic disease and now we learn infectious disease. Um, yeah. that, so thank you for that reminder. Um, so I, I feel so fortunate to have been working with you guys now for, for geez, we're coming on four years and, and um, I've learned so much. It's been a real privilege. You'll see lots of photos that we took way back when I visited in 2017. And eventually you'll see photos um, that you've submitted too. We'll include some of those. Um, today, <clears throat> we're joined to do this work with, by Peter Gajewski, who's been a, a, a real uh, leader in this work over these four years with the Department of Public Works. Uh, is your title still, is it Design Program Manager, Peter? Do I have that right? Or is it even bigger cheese than that now? No, design program manager is correct. But really we know him as the grand fromage, the big cheese. He's the guy who understands how it works and has made a huge difference in a lot of the good work's happening. And a new friend and colleague, Dr. Greg Guenal, who's at UVI's, um, the, the Coastal Green Technology Center there in, in, and who is gonna bring another insight and help us make this connection between walkability, which we've been talking about for two or three years and re resilience because they are just deeply intertwined and really to get it right at, at the territory level, you have to be thinking about both of these at the same time. Again, my name is Mark Fenton. I live in the greater Boston area. I'm a, an engineer by training. I've been working at the confluence of public health planning and transportation for uh, um, over 25 years now. And I do a lot of work with the Centers for Disease Control and a lot of their funded communities. Uh, and I feel really fortunate to have connected with this project through CDC. So our goals today briefly, we'd like to talk a little bit about the, the, the walkability initiative, just to give you background on that. I'm gonna suggest just to start the conversation, some ideas around how re resilience and walkability and active transportation connect together. By the way, the term active transportation really refers to three travel modes, walking, bicycling, and transit. Every one of the times we don't start a car and use one of those modes, we have positive benefits to our health, but also to the environmental health, right? We both see benefit, personal health and environmental health. Um, I would even argue, by the way, economic health. We know that more walkable communities tend to be more vibrant. The businesses are more sustainable. There are really benefits in all three areas. We're going to talk briefly about a couple of demonstration projects that got started through the Walkability Institute. And then um, uh, uh, Peter's going to chat a little more about how uh, Public Works is continuing to, to sort of incorporate walkability and active transportation into ongoing work, including you know, hurricane recovery and, and reconstruction efforts. And then uh, Greg's gonna lead us through an exercise where we actually use an active mapping program that they, they've developed to actually look at sites uh, around the territory that are relevant and maybe opportunity areas here. Uh, and we, we might conclude, I hope, with some photos from you. You get, Some of you submitted photos ahead of time, so I'm hoping we'll have time to, to look at some of those. Some of those are really cool images. Uh, pictures on the right here are from in 2017 spring when we did walk audits, the idea of getting out and walking an environment, moving under your own power, very different than looking at it theoretically or just looking at maps and drawings. Um, we find people get a very different experience. For example, here we were at the Sunny Isle Shopping Center, but we recognized that there was actually a shortcut path kind of cut through, through um, undeveloped area behind uh, the, the shopping center that, that clearly people were using. It was a worn path on the ground to shortcut back up toward where the hospital is and so on in St. Croix. So that was kind of interesting. And you would never discover that if you were driving, but you walk it and then you find the path and you say, wow, maybe this is an area we could make an improvement for walking. Um, the idea of the Institute was to, to make the big connection between public health and the built environment. Sometimes I, I work in communities where people say, well, nobody walks or bikes here anyway. I don't know why we're doing this work. And of course, uh, these images and many, many more uh, put the lie to that. We know that lots of people are out making their way on foot, um, that even driving trips often start and end with a walk. Um, you say, well, we don't have bicycle lanes pointed here, but I've seen plenty of people out trying to navigate the world on bikes. And what's interesting is this guy is probably not out for an exercise ride. That looks to me like a functional trip. He's got bags there. He's been to the store or, or maybe he's carrying his lunch to work. Um, he's got a knapsack on. Um, and we should make it easy for him. He's doing things that are good for all of us. He's reducing his greenhouse gas footprint. He's one less car on the road we have to compete with. He's one less car we have to park at his destination. We don't have to create a parking space. He'll be more healthy, we hope, and therefore less costly to the healthcare system. So he's doing all of us a favor. Why do we drive up behind him and beep when he's in our way on the road? Why aren't we thanking? We should drive by and say, thank you for riding your bike and making the world a better place, the territory a better place for all of us. I just want to remind you of that because I think we sometimes forget. Um, 
So quick messages. This is a message you would get from Kathleen and I, the kind of the classic public health perspective on this. We know we should be physically active. On average, we'd love adults to average about 30 minutes of physical activity a day as a minimum. Youth, 60 minutes a day. That would reduce your risk for everything Kathleen talked about. Cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, clinical depression, dementia uh, in old age, a growing list of cancers. All of those risks are reduced with moderate daily activity, and it doesn't have to be these pictures. Everybody thinks, well, you mean go to the gym, plan a sports league. No, walk your child to school. If an adult walked 15 minutes to and from school with a kid every day, they would get their 30 minutes and the child would get at least half of their recommended minimum dose. We know if you can do more, you get, you get better benefits, but even that 30 minutes of moderate daily activity is beneficial. Here's the problem. We've built a world where we don't do that. Most Americans are not meeting that standard and that, that, that data holds in the territory. We tend to drive everywhere. Um, we also, our jobs are increasingly sedentary. Our recreation is, we spend a lot of screen time. And so if you look at data on actual meeting of the recommendation, it's as few as 40% uh, of youth, kids, right? And kids run around, they're supposed to be active. Every, it should be 100% of kids at least getting an hour of activity a day. But we're looking at more like 40%. By the time they get to adolescence, the number's under 10%. And among adults, the number's closer to 5%. These are really disheartening numbers for somebody like me who spent the last 25 years promoting physical activity because it's good for us. It's really distressing to see that's where we are. And part of the reason is because we built an environment that discourages routine physical activity. So what we know is there's a good body of research now that describes settings where people tend to take active transportation more often. They tend to walk, ride a bike, hop on the bus, take transit. And th these are the four attributes. If, there are lots of research papers, but I've boiled it down to, I think, four piles. One, there's a greater variety of destinations that are close enough together so they are within walk and bike distance, right? So we have where we live and work and shop and play intermingle. I must say that on the mainland in the US, one of the great disasters of the last 40 years is that we've gone to this largely segregated land use. We have malls over here, housing subdivisions over here, big school complexes and sports fields over here, but you've got to drive between all of them, right? Segregated land use, separated land uses. Whereas if you think about traditional community design, we had neighborhoods that had a mix. You had a corner store and there was a neighborhood school and maybe a park or a playground. So number one, mix of destinations. Number two, the network of facilities, sidewalks, bicycle lanes, pathways. Third, when you arrive somewhere, it should reward you for showing up on foot. So in other words, that picture in the lower right sort of says, yes, pedestrians are welcome here. Wide sidewalks, awnings on buildings, street trees that provide shade, benches, bicycle racks. And last but not least, it's got to be safe for everybody of all ages and all abilities and disabilities. Uh, the picture on the left, a classic curb ramp. We need those curb ramps at every intersection. So somebody in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller or pulling a luggage cart can navigate it. The picture on the right there on the, uh, on the bottom center is of a raised crosswalk. We sometimes call this a speed table because you go up, it's flat on top and it goes down. It's a crosswalk elevating the pedestrian, making them more visible and slowing traffic down because there is a little bit of a, an elevation change there. We like these more than speed bumps, really sharp ones, which are much harder on the cars. Gradual rise, flat on top, gradual drop. It's an engineering tool we're seeing used more and more in places where you've got lots of pedestrians and vehicles intermingling. I can't help but think of a place, uh, Elaine, who was on the call, uh, shared um, photos from Cruise Bay. You know, we've got a lot of pedestrians interacting with vehicles in a very compact space. Things like speed tables might be an appropriate tool there. As you think about everything I'm saying, you can start to imagine the potential resilient benefits. Uh, obviously, as I said a moment ago, a physically active population is more resistant to chronic disease, but also infectious disease. So from a, from a simple base level sort of resilience standpoint, a healthier population is more ready to withstand challenges. Um, but very specifically, um, we know if people are driving more than their greenhouse gas footprint is less, um, that a more resilient transportation network is less fuel dependent, right? You guys depend on all that fuel to be imported for vehicles. The more we walk and bike, and after, a, after by the way, a, a disaster or an event, um, the, we can see disruptions in fuel uh, delivery. So uh, a system that, uh, that allows more walking, bicycling, and transit use is less dependent on that fuel. Um, 
as we get more people walking and biking, we can start to change that picture in the top right. Do we really have to create all of that parking at every time we create a retail environment, all right, or a commercial, an employer or a, a store? Do they need all of that parking? Because if we could reduce that, we reduce the, the, the greenhouse gas uh, implication, but also just the heat island effect, right? It's a giant solar, solar absorber. And the amount of impervious surface that is creating stormwater runoff that contributes to flow, localized flooding, right? So anytime we can reduce that, that's beneficial. And as I talked about mixed use before, as you start to think about creating neighborhood centers with retail and other local services provided within walking distance, rather than having just one big consolidated retail area, right, a mall, but rather neighborhood centers, those can be centers for recovery after a disaster. They can be the places where food and water distribution happens, where local medical services are provided, uh, where people convene. Um, uh, but if there's only one of those, then we all have to get to that central location, right? So these are all ways that good, uh, I believe, uh, healthy design, walkable design, bicycle des friendly and transit friendly design serves uh, resilience. Um, I'm gonna take a breath there to see if any of the other panelists wanna add to that right now. I suspect Greg will weigh in on this in detail when he speaks. And by the way, feel free to throw, if, you don't, if you're not the kind of person that likes to unmute and ask a question, go ahead and throw questions in the chat. Let me just say that there's a, an entire discipline um, uh, that both Greg and Peter are familiar with called low impact development. Sometimes you'll hear the acronym LID. And the idea here is that when we do do design, we do have to still create a parking lot or a sidewalk or a road. Um, we can reduce the impact by the details of design. So that's called a, a swale, a drainage swale in the middle of the parking lot there. So water collects there and is infiltrated back into the ground as much as possible. And only when it gets above a certain level does it join the stormwater sewer system. On the right, that's a rain garden uh, next to that sidewalk, again, capturing stormwater runoff from the road and the sidewalk there and trying to put it back in the ground rather than channelizing it and putting it in a big detention basin or into the sewer system. And these are just two quick shots of the kinds of treatments that are being used. So as we do more walkable and active transportation oriented design, we have the opportunity to think about what methods do we use to maximize resilience and sustainability. I'm going to share just briefly um, one, and then Peter is going to share a, a couple of other projects that are ongoing now. Uh, coming out of the Walkability Institute, one of the challenges with, from the CDC was we can give you a little bit of grant money, not much, small money to buy things like signs and paint and, you know, simple traffic structures, but, you know, you're not, not going to be enough money to pour a lot of asphalt or concrete. Can you come up with some ideas uh, to improve walkability and measure even whether they have an impact. So one was when we did our walk audit at, at the Sunny Isle um, shopping area there, it was identified there's a lot of pedestrian activity across the highway out in front um, and no, no marked pedestrian crosswalk. So a recommendation was to create a crosswalk here. It was being painted or soon after. Um, and it gets to um, some retail on the other side of the street. Often people, by the way, also pick up a van on the other side of the street, sort of a, you know, a taxi van. Um, so that crosswalk was created with signs. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and uh, I think some of the materials were actually painted through, paid for through the CDC grant. Here's an aerial view that shows you that crosswalk. You can see that people used to cross all over the place. Sometimes people hang out here waiting for a, a van, for a pickup. One of the interesting things that I give great credit to the team for doing was actually measuring both before and after installation of the crosswalk, um, vehicle speeds, where people were crossing, do they tend to cross at the crosswalk or are they just crossing anywhere, and whether vehicles are yielding. Right, and uh, they did it once right after it was installed, about three weeks, and then one closer to a year later to see if there was any sustained impact or change over time. Did people get used to this? Did it alter their behavior? And this is a cool slide created by the CDC, but based on the data you guys collected that said that in fact, more people did use the crosswalk the longer it was in place. So initially it was only about 15% of folks were using the crosswalk after it was painted. But later, a year later, it was closer to 60% or more. Um, so people were becoming accustomed to it and realizing what crossing at the crosswalk was safer and beneficial. Really interestingly, speeds went down notably about 25% before versus after the crosswalk in place. So drivers started to expect to see it and see pedestrians we think, and that influenced their behavior. Um, a little frustrating was the news that um, drivers still didn't necessarily yield for pedestrians at the crosswalk, um, both before and after something like 70, 80% of the time a pedestrian had to wait for um, 
uh, a car to pass before they were allowed to walk. So that, you know, what we'd hope is maybe an educational campaign and some outreach could help change that behavior over time. But it's really cool to collect this kind of data and, and it allows you to learn about, okay, what could we do? What do we learn from this? One more thing that's happening there is um, Kathleen has helped and, and John Orr with the health department and others, Desiree's been instrumental. Uh, and the idea was there's no sidewalk along the highway right there, uh, as you can see. And people would often walk either on the edge of the parking lot or the edge of the road. But there are these nice shade trees that are actually quite mature, provide shade. So the question was, could we create a temporary walkway and see if people would use it? And so um, they were able to get Kathleen, I think, helped get the um, these rum barrels donated uh, for use to create a sort of a defined pedestrian walkway here. You can also see the entryway to the parking lot, a painted crosswalk was created. Um, and uh, it'll be very interesting to see over time um, if pedestrians tend to gravitate to this walkway and stay in there versus walking along the edge of the road. We would like to think this would be much safer. They're protected by the barrels and there's a defined walkway. And by the way, people often set up and, you know, and do sort of informal selling right there under the trees, right? Little informal market. Um, that may continue and the walkway may not necessarily disturb that. It's going to be really interesting to see over time how that all plays out. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that description. Um, Desiree, you were there during setup. I, I'd offer that. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter to talk about one of the other demonstration projects. But anybody wanna add on the, on the Sunny Isle pathway or crosswalk? Well, I can add some to that. I actually, probably a couple of days later after it was placed, I actually parked up at 845 in that area. Probably was a day after the holiday that I thought that we were going to get together in the morning and I actually parked up there at 845 and trekked like about three people actually using the walkway. And um, I was excited about that and, and using the crosswalk. And that was about a busy time, like between eight and nine. So I thought that there was some activity. Now what I'd like to do and what we plan to do is probably go out earlier because I know that people use that route as well for exercise. So I would like to have some more activity there. So I would make it my business. I think Kathleen just froze. Um, are you guys still hearing me? Am, am I still live? <laughs> Frozen on my screen. Oh yeah, okay, now you're back. So that's a great idea though. So we, and we wanna collect the data here like the data was collected um, uh, on the crosswalk and see, we hope change over time. Cause what we'd love to do is make that walkway permanent, right? You know? And by the way, mall management, you know, the shopping plaza management have involved in the conversation. So this is that you guys have done a really good job of building the partnership to have this whole conversation and do this little exercise. Not little, I think it's pretty substantial actually, it's great. Okay, with that, I'm gonna ask Peter, talk a little about um, St. Thomas and I'll try to advance the slides, but you can tell me if I'm not keeping up with you um, and the work you guys did over at Perimeter uh, Road there. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Peter Gajewski, Department of Public Works. Um, I'm going to briefly explain the demonstration project on St. Thomas. Um, here you have um, an overhead view of the location. Um, it's located in between the hospital on the left and the medical buildings on the right side. And also there's a going further to the, or sorry, on the right side, going further on the right side, there's also um, a uh, commercial area back there with various um, retail and um, commercial destinations. So we, um, we identified this location as a, as a good spot for um, a demonstration because of the amount of pedestrians we had that were traveling between the hospital and the medical buildings. On, on the other side, as well as going to various other destinations. And existing, there were no, um, no pedestrian facilities um, with the exception of a, of, of a small pedestrian bridge that crossed over the drainage channel in between the two segments of Perimeter Road. And both of those segments of Perimeter Road are two-way traffic. Mm -hmm. So this area um, is, really kind of lacked um, good traffic design. Um, they, they, there was you know, poor striping um, and just the traffic patterns were uh, less than idea. But there were a lot of people using this, um, this area. 
So what we decided to do was um, to create crosswalks on both sides to provide a, a, a safer uh, path for, for the pedestrians and to also to encourage more people. So, you know, we were finding that if um, people would drive from the hospital to, um, to the destinations on the other side and we wanted to encourage walking. So what we did, we had some volunteers from a local contractor, First Resort Painting, um, helped us install this crosswalk. Um, they went out on one weekend and we had painted a, a standard crosswalk and as well as um, installed some footprints to show um, the pedestrians which way to follow. And along with the crosswalk, which you don't see here, but now we have um, mm. signage going in both direction, advanced warning signage, which um, it give the motorists some advanced warning of the, the pedestrian facility ahead. So, um, and currently, you know, we, I, I see we have a lot of people using this facility and I think it's been well received. Um, I'm not sure if we, I don't think we have our final data yet with regard to um, uh, the, the behavior of the motorists and pedestrians, but I, um, I do believe that this is a, a very effective demonstration. And one feature that we st still have yet to install, we want to um, install a, a, a road mounted sign in the middle of the crosswalk in between the, the two directions of traffic that will um, hopefully increase the, um, the visibility as well as the, um, the rate of, of what vehicles are yielding for pedestrians. Right. So here, um, this is in this slide, um, this is also uh, something else that the, the Walkability Institute has been involved in, which is to create our first um, bicycle facility in the territory. Um, we are working with uh, the Virgin Island Trail Alliance, as well as with the biking community on St. Croix to install our first ever um, bicycle facility. And this is on the Christiansted bypass. And what we plan to do is have a dedicated bike lane in the shoulder for, the, for most of the segment and in one area where it narrows, where we have a, 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 the, the mountainside adjacent to the roadway, we're going to actually have a, a shared use path, which is kind of shown on, on the bottom right. Um, and we've actually, we've partnered with some local engineers on St. Croix and they actually had an opportunity to follow up yesterday. And they are actually um, pro bono, um, hmm working on the actual design of the, the pathway, um, which will meet all of the, the federal and local requirements as far as signing and striping and safety. And they're actually preparing that design, which we will then have to present to Federal Highway to get approval. And hopefully um, within the next few months, we will um, finalize that plan and we'll have the first um, bicycle facility in the territory. Uh, very, very exciting. And hopefully we can repeat this in other areas um, throughout, throughout the territory. Um, I, I, I'll acknowledge that both Virgin Isle Trails Alliance and AARP, I think were pretty AARP. instrumental, right? Yeah. I just yeah. to get... AARP, yeah. They're very instrumental and, and great partners. Outstanding. Um, Hey, a, a question. We had uh, two questions in the box that I'll, I'll throw to you, Peter, but not because you're, you're necessarily the only one. Others can comment too. One is Don O'Brien asked about learning about eco-friendly materials for roadways. Is there work happening around that? Do you guys, you know, is DPW doing any of that? But she's asking sort of what's our knowledge around that and are there resources, places we can learn more about that? Yeah, I, I know um, a Federal Highway does have some resources available. Um, I can try to look up and provide the links. There is some um, permeable as or, um, concrete service uh, yeah. surfaces that um, I know that they've... Oh, Peter has just frozen on mine. Is, is he on yours, guys? Uh, I will just say a quick point about this. We've actually used some pervious concrete on a trail in my community here. Um, we're still trying to evolve the understanding of it because, so that's one way to be eco-friendly, right? Allow water to, to move through the concrete rather than have to run off. The difficulty can be 
um, it can uh, it has to be cleaned because the once the porosity is filled with dust and so on, it loses much of the porosity. So that's a to, um, uh, uh, there's need to do that to 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 keep it clean. And there's continuing effort around. All right, are there are there more sustainable less are there versions that require less maintenance uh, over time? Um, a second question in the form that I'm just going to throw in is Miguel uh, Quinones asked, are you collaborating with the VI government for the creation of a comprehensive land and water use plan? And um, my question is, by the way, is that, an, uh, uh, is that an actually underway or are you proposing we need one? Is Miguel, are you able to unmute and actually speak to that for a moment? And maybe others can weigh in on this. You, could, you, could you share on that? I'm not sure if Miguel is is uh, under un, unmuting or not. Not hearing him yet. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. All right. So, uh, as far as I know, um, the Department of Natural Resources was waiting on the funding from uh, Vitima or FEMA to become available in order to put out an RFP for the plan. So, my question is, were you? working with DPNR in, internally in that process um, in preparation for that RFP to go out in, to make sure that we have things like this uh, as part of the scope of work that is required to be done with the plan. Brilliant. And, and boy, do you make an important point about that. That's got to be way up front in the scope. Otherwise, it could be the plan could go forward and it never, you know, some of these kinds of things don't even get included. So I'm not aware of that. Does anybody know if that's the case? Is anybody on the call able to answer that? Greg may have an insight on this actually. Yes, I think that there's some discussion, um, but um, I don't think that from my knowledge, um, there are, um, there is, a, those, those considerations are being taken yet. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's still under discussion, um, hopefully, um, yeah. So, so I'm going to propose that's a huge area of opportunity. That, that would be, and it would be a huge missed opportunity if that scope and RFP go out uh, without inclusion explicitly around things such as a complete streets policy and, or which is the, the policy that says every time the touch of, we touch a roadway, we think about all four user groups, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, and motor vehicles. Um, uh, it, that's a, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, it would normally, if you were serious about that, you, you would incorporate that in that kind of a land use plan, right? Land and water use plan, um, as would obviously great land use decision making, right? Around, around some of the things we talked about around creating nodes uh, of mixed use that are walkable destinations and bikeable destinations. All of that's got to be really explicitly asked for in a plan like that. So um, I'm thinking that that's an, an, a specific takeaway action that may come out of our conversation today, because boy, that the last thing you want is that to go out and not include those considerations. So Miguel, thank you for putting that forward. Um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to, uh, to Gregory Gwinnell with the uh, UVI to talk a little about the work that they are doing the connection to the Walkability Institute, and then we're going to do a little mapping exercise to look for locations of interest. You're still muted, Greg. I'm just telling you that in case you're thinking you're unmuted. Yes, yes. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me. Let me just share my screen here. Um, Right. So, um, Mark, I think you touched upon um, a lot of the um, some of the topics uh, that I think make you know really raise my uh, attention um, and 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 really make this partnership wonderful. Because, as you mentioned, uh, improving walkability, improving transportation uh, option really increases the resilience of the ter the, the territory. And um, you know, this is the question that we are asking ourselves um, as we work on the USVI Hazard Mitigation and Resilience Plan. Um, just very quickly, it's, uh, we're working on this plan on behalf of Vitima uh, and the territory. Uh, it's a plan that is updated every five years and uh, all the projects that we're gonna be listing in this plan will be eligible for pre and post uh, mitigation funding. So it's really an opportunity to think about 
the type of projects that we need to embark upon in the territory to reduce our risk to disaster and increase our resilience. And transportation is uh, one of those areas that really sort of um, need a, a whole lot of attention uh, for some of the reasons that you mentioned, and I'm gonna sort of dive into them a little bit more. Um, just in terms of quick background, you know, what we're doing at the HMP is um, we're looking at different hazards that can happen in the territory and also at the impact of climate change without making those hazards, you know, worse. And then we are asking ourselves, what is it that we can do so that when an earthquake, you know, hit, when there is a long drought, when sea level rise starts to erode the beaches, what is it that we need to do so that we are not impacted, our well-being is not impacted, our ability to do the things we want to do and we like to do uh, is not impacted. So just, uh, you know, we, in the process, we've developed some maps of, you know, different hazards and how different hazards can impact us. This is a map showing, you know, tsunami depth, inundation depth uh, uh, along the, the three islands. And what you see is that all the, for tsunami, which is not surprising, pretty much all coastal areas are underwater, but more importantly, uh, all the city centers, you know, uh, Charlotte Amalia, Christianstead, Cruz Bay, uh, uh, Frederickstead, et cetera, the east end of St. Thomas, they're all underwater. And so really we're asking ourselves the question, if, you know, all of those facilities and areas where people live and, and, and do stuff are underwater, what does that mean for transportation? Um, this is another map showing, um, you know, the type of flooding that, you know, we get if it, you know, when it rains, uh, the sort of flood areas. Uh, and you, again, uh, not only all the coastal flood areas, but also some of the inland areas. And then in red, it's showing how it's going to get worse under a sea level rise scenario by 2050, 2040. Uh, and again, you know, if you look on St. Thomas, you know, there's a big a housing community here. It's not too far from the hospital. Uh, you know, this is Christian Stead where people like to go on the boardwalk and really sort of enjoy uh, walking around. So the question is, you know, what does that mean for transportation? And what that means for transportation is that, you know, sometimes cars, you know, are, are not, are, are stranded. Uh, these, these are pictures, you know, on St. Thomas uh, that happen at different times, uh, different years. But, you know, I'm sure that similar pictures uh, can be found on uh, St. Croix and St. John as well, where, you know, here a car is basically um, pretty much totaled uh, that because the, the, there was a soft shoulder and the car basically didn't see uh, the end of the road because of the water and fell into a hole. Uh, and then here, um, you know, this car was pretty much stalled because of the elevation of the water. And so the question is what happens to emergency? What happens, are there options for people to get out safely and walk if they need help? Are there options for other people to safely get to them if they cannot get, you know, to them by car? More importantly, in these pictures, for those who decide not to drive because they see this situation, you know, is it safe for them to, to actually walk and, and, and use either uh, walking or a car, uh, excuse me, a bicycle as you know, an alternate mode of transportation. So we're really thinking about you know, what happens if you cannot use your vehicle? What happens if you need to get out of a dangerous situation? Can you do it using alternate mode of transportation? So looking back um, at the VI sort of history and evolution of infrastructure, there was this concept back in the day in the, you know, 1800, early 1900 of utilitarian architecture, where, you know, as, and this is here in uh, Christian stead, as, you know, they were building streets and they were sort of slowly developing different modes of transportation, they were really thinking about how to do it in a way that people can move around, people are not bothered by uh, uh, or unencumbered by different type of, you know, natural events such as flooding. And what I like particularly here is the fact that, you know, as you can see, they really thought about access to this building. Uh, the road was shaped in a way, and it's still the case in most of places, it's shaped in a way to move water to, you know, each of the guts on the side of the road. But they're really thinking about utilitarian concept. How can we make sure people don't have to cross through waters? How do we make sure people can still access? And so access point is here, which is a relatively high point. 
go over the gut so they can move in and out and walk uh, without being uh, um, sort of bothered by floodwaters. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not a, a, an architect or, 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 or urban planner, so those are just my observation. Um, but uh, my observation basically is saying that, you know, in the 60s, cars starting to be introduced. And so now, you know, as Mark mentioned, the, you know, incentives to walk uh, starts to get lower, but you also start to run into safety issues. You know, we didn't start thinking about sidewalks. We didn't think about the fact that, you know, we want to continue to promote walking. We want to promote alternate mode of transportation. And now there's barely any sidewalk. I don't know exactly where the sidewalk starts. I don't know where it ends, but you have a piece of sidewalk with a fire hydrant on the other sides. Anyway, you get the picture. The, the, we developed to a point now where, as Mark mentioned, um, you know, we no longer have options for, uh, for walking. And, and this prioritization of car as the only mode of transportation really uh, 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 discourages uh, walking discourages outdoor access, and that have all the negative impact that Mark mentioned and as uh, I mentioned. So from the HMP, the way that we look at you know walking and really thinking about you know creating walkable island is number one creating alternative emergency escape routes where cars are not an option. Rather, whether it's because there there is flooding or because uh, the roads are damaged. Uh, or because there are so many cars on the road that you actually have to go and run. And that's mostly in the case of a tsunami. But in that case, you need to have alternate roads. You need to have alternates uh, uh, that allow you to do it in a safe way. We also look at it, and Mark mentioned it, because it improves physical health. So it reduces the dependence and the strain on the health system. And that's really you know, particularly good you know, a good thing to think about, you know, for disaster recovery. People with existing mobility factors, such as hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, they, after a storm, there's a lot of special needs. We need to think about ref refrigerating their medicine. We need to think about, you know, ensuring access to drugs. Um, the fewer people we have to think about, the more we're gonna be able to help those who actually need those. So the healthier the population, the better we are, when we think about dealing with a post-disaster situation and a recovery situation. It's also good for mental health. Walking, you know, getting some fresh air, moving your body really helps with mental health and reduces the risk of depression, which is again, really good at any time, you know, but also after disasters. And we saw a spike in a lot of mental health issue after disasters. So encouraging and creating more opportunity for outdoor activity is great. And then the last thing is it improves community, community cohesion. You see a friend, you see somebody you don't know, but you start a conversation with a stranger. All of those experiences happen when you start walking. You start to see things that make you happy and you start to you know, strike a conversation with a homeowner about how their garden was this and that. So this improving community cohesion is again, really something that we think about because after this, the, the, the best thing that experts have said can be do, done to really improve community preparedness is talking to neighbors, is reaching out to others and making connection. It's, it's one of the biggest, most effective ways for disaster preparedness. Yes, you need to have your you know, canned food and water, but knowing your neighbor, knowing, you know, making connection with people around you really goes a long way uh, to help in times of need and walking really promotes those. So for those four different reasons, uh, you know, we really are thinking, we see the benefits of this initiative and these efforts, you know, that the workability is doing, the Department of Health and Department of Public Works are doing, and how it really sort of merges really well with some of the message that we are communicating through the hazard mitigation plan effort. And as you can see in the pictures that, you know, Mark has provided and Mark had a lot of success stories. Unfortunately, right now we're mostly documenting so that we can make the case and start promoting the type of projects that Mark mentioned. But as part of this documenting, you know, you can see things like, you know, this person who is by himself, you know, trying to clean the gut to try to reduce the amount of flooding because when it rains, people cannot access his store. People cannot walk in and out of, you know, their car to get the store or to walk along this road. So, you know, really thinking about beyond just 
walking and creating sidewalk, making sure that you know the the maintenance and 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 the sort of interdependence between different elements works well, so that people you know can actually use some of those facilities. Uh, here, you know, an experience that I think all of us uh, you know have gone through of you know getting rid of our garbage. You know, we have to walk through muddy, dirty, probably heavily contaminated, contaminated waters. Um, so thinking about, you know, access, you know, we, yes, we have access to the car, to the dump site, but we need to get out of the car and we need to do it in a safe way that, you know, we don't get hit by a car or we don't, you know, get some, some, some disease or the form of contamination in the process. And then this is the classic picture again of, you know, Mark mentioned some of this, but, you know, when it rains, it floods. And, you know, these people have to cross, you know, through these waters. Uh, and so anyway, we sort of looking at it, you know, from different angles and really start to think about how can we ensure that people have access to different modes of transportation and, you know, uh, especially thinking about the type of events and the type of services that we depend on. So I'm gonna stop here to see if there's any questions or comment from my colleagues, and then we're gonna jump into uh, a little exercise. I'll just um, add that there's been a great dialogue going on in, in both the chat, but there's a Q&A forum and we're answering questions in there. And one particular one that got asked was about, does we show demonstration projects on St. Thomas and St. John, I'm sorry, St. Croix. <clears throat> and the question was, is there one on St. John? And there was one underway, it's intended to be near that roundabout on Fish Fry Road near the fire department and the community center there, or the tennis courts, I think would be maybe a defining attribute is another area. So there are two places where crosswalks may be get, getting built. Um, and um, um, we're happy to connect people, by the way, with the groups on each island that are working on the demonstration projects, if that's of interest. So, okay. and just one more thing to add on the demonstration project. Sorry, I, I lost connection earlier. Um, the, these demonstration projects, they're temporary. You know, they're, they're meant to, um, you know, they are for raising awareness and just kind of identifying locations and um, looking at, you know, different ways that we can make improvements. Now, if these things become successful, we'll certainly find um, we will um, make permanent improvements to, to make sure that these, um, these features last. And um, just with the with same thing with the St. John location, um, you know, we, we've identified this location and, and we're looking to just put in something temporary. But as we get, um, you know, we move forward with our recovery projects and move forward with our larger capital projects, we'll permanently incorporate these into our roadways. Great. That's why we're collecting data too, obviously that, right? To make sure that they actually are making a difference. Any other yeah. comments or questions for Greg? Greg, thanks for that context. No then, problem. Uh, yeah, it's really good and it's reassuring. Mm -hmm. I think Desert yeah. suggested, by the way, that the gentleman cleaning, uh, doing the, the cleaning in one area there was the governor. Is that, is that possible? No. It was, uh, it was the, one of the, uh, I believe the son or the owner of the uh, purple shop. The, the business the, is right there. The oh, all right. I think maybe the person walking in downtown St. Thomas. In the oh, street. yes, yes. I believe that's a picture. Oh, of oh okay. Wrong yes. photo. Wrong photo. Yes. Got it. I saw I write the note and I didn't time it. Okay, so um, maybe we jump into the exercise. Yeah. Great. All right. So what I'll do is um, we have a little exercise for you guys to do where you're gonna sort of look uh, at a map and sort of point, you know, zoom to a region of interest and then point to a region where you think, you know, the walking experience can be improved, walking or biking experience can be improved. So um, we're gonna do two things, uh, three things. Number one, um, I'm gonna show you a website and put the, the, the link in the chat right now where you can, if you have taken some pictures or have pictures of areas that need improvement, um, you can upload the, the pictures uh, in those locations. So the drive, uh, drive.google link that is in the chat right now is, um, is the link that you need to use to uh, just go ahead, find the pictures and upload it. 
if you can put a name, your name in the file, that would be good. So we can, you know, thank you and, and give the proper credit. Um, so just go ahead and do that. Um, the second thing is, um, I'm gonna have you all go to this uh, link here, which is the USVI hmrp.maps.rgis.com link. So if you can click on that, that's what we're gonna be using for the exercise. And at the top, you will see St. Croix, St. John and St. Thomas. You can pick your island. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna play a little video. And this video was created for a slightly different purpose, but 90% of the content is relevant today. It's a bit of a how to on how to use that uh, mapping tool. So I'm gonna share that with you. Oops, sorry, I need to make sure that there's some sound when I share. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna look at a video. It's, uh, you know, um, three minutes long, um, but it's very informative to help explain to you how to use uh, the link. Breakout group of the 2020 Hazard Mitigation and Resilience Plan Workshop. In this session, you will be identifying areas of concern and points of interest in the Virgin Islands on a map. First, go to the map website. The link will be provided in the chat box in your breakout group. So use the link that I put in the chat. Uh, this link is for different exercise. So use the link I use in the chat. Or you can go to bit.ly slash hazard underscore identity map. Once on the website, choose the island that you would like to input data using the tabs here. To add a data point to the map, click the edit icon here. Choose which type of data you would like to input. The blue circle is where flooding occurs and the yellow star shows points of interest that are important to you and your community. So here you will only see one point, which is, uh, you know, the point where walking or biking can be improved, but the spirit is the same. You can find a location on the map by typing in the search bar. You can also use the icons here to zoom in or out. Another method is to hover your mouse over the area you would like to zoom in and use the scroll bar to zoom in or out. To reset the screen, click the home button and you will go back to the original screen. Once you have found a location on the map, click to record a data point. Oops, first you need to select what type of data you wanna record. Now you can click to record a data point. A pop-up window will come up. The object ID is automatically updated and keeps a tally of the data points entered. The location of flood is where you will enter the area name and description of where you know flooding occurs. If you would like, you can enter your name and last name so we can contact you if we would like to follow up on the data point. If not, you can leave this field blank. The final field asks for the level of flooding in a range of one to five, with one being minor or infrequent and five being severe or frequent flooding. You may also add relevant comments to this field. When you are finished entering the data, click close. Your data point will be saved. Now let's try entering a point of interest. So I'm gonna stop there um, because um, you know, the principle is the same. And so, um, okay, you can still see my screen. So um, hopefully that's sort of, that's clear. Um, but just to recap uh, here, the edit button, there is a point, that's the point that, you know, will, that you will place on the map to show regions where, you know, walking can, the walking experience or the biking experience can be, you know, improved. You're gonna, zoom to the location that you are interested in. And I'm just, you know, zoom in here, for example, click on the point, bring it to the map, release it. You put your name, 
the location if you know it or the location it's known by or whatever sort of way to sort of mention that place in that region of the island. If you have uploaded a picture in that location, give us the file name for that picture so that in the Google uh, uh, Drive, you know, we can go and say, okay, this is the, the picture that, you know, this person was talking about. And then any other comments that you have, um, just uh, put them there. If you want to delete, you click on it, oops, and you click delete. And the point is deleted. Otherwise, you enter the information, you click close, and the point is saved. Do you guys have any questions before we start? Any questions in the Q&A? All right. Well, one person asked for the link, so we reposted it. So the last entry in the chat should be the link if you've had any trouble. And the, the link is working, so I think it's good. Joanne, if you have any trouble, let us know, but I think you've probably got it. All right, so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and you know start populating. And uh, Mark, how long should we be doing this? Five well, minutes, minutes? Let's, give people, let's give people at least a few minutes to get a couple of things in, but I, I'm, I'm right in saying, this is available. I've gone to it several times since you introduced me to it. Um, they, they don't, if they don't have something on top of their head right now, they could do this later, right? Or if they are out, oh, yes. the, they're walking on a sidewalk and they're saying, boy, this sidewalk really gets a lot of flooding after a rainstorm. They could take a photo of that and put it in, it, it, right? It, it doesn't yes. have to all be right this minute. I just want to make sure. That is correct. Hmm. So, so, so one of the things we're asking you to do is be sort of the eyes and ears and feet of positive change by um, sort of, you know, looking for these opportunities. And, and they don't either have to be exclusively a resilience issue like flooding or a walkability issue like a missing crosswalk. Sometimes there'll be crossover issues, but we're happy to see in both categories. I'm gonna tell you one that I put in which was uh, the Christiansted bypass had not been identified yet. And I think that's a real opportunity area. But interestingly enough, on the Eastern end of that, it's also an area. So if you were to walk on that nice sidewalk on the bypass, when you get down to the Eastern end at the intersection, that's also one of the flooding sites. It's an area that sees um, a decent amount of flooding. So you have to think about oh, what happens to the pedestrian access. You have this great pathway and then you get to the bottom of the hill and you're right in, in, the, in the drink as it were. On, uh, uh, during a flood uh, event. So here I just, you know, put one point. It's hard to cross sometimes the road, um, you know, at UVI going from one point to another. I don't have a picture, uh, but I made a comment about it. And then I'm just going to close that. Wait, just, I'm going to switch to the St. Thomas map because I want to actually see where you did that, Greg. So uh, take me through that. I'm, I have to, first of all, I have to change my tab, right? To look at St. Thomas. That is correct. And I can see that some people already have put some points in other part of uh, St. Thomas campus. So St. Thomas campus UVI is getting a lot of love. This is great. And I want to mention that um, actually on this webinar, um, there are a few uh, UVI faculty and students um, uh, because they are interested in improving the workability experience uh, on the campus. So I'm really Excellent. glad to see that. I'm suggesting we, we leave this, you know, do this for a few minutes. And, and what I'd love to do is ask people if they wouldn't mind maybe to unmute and share what they're doing, or at least throw it in the, uh, in the chat. I'll look at the chat and read out any comments, uh, because I think it'd be nice for people to hear what others are thinking about and seeing and mentioning. But um, I'm looking right now. Somebody said there's one in the Q&A. Anybody want to share one you're putting in? I believe um, maybe the host need to uh, unmute the participants. 
Oh yeah, are people having trouble unmuting? I'm gonna actually bring up a, an interesting conversation that was happening in the Q and A, if I could do that, just while you're, if any, while you continue mapping, keep it But Sharon asked an interesting question. She said, do you have anything special thought about places where most people live on the hillside? So in other words, there's a lot of topography on the islands and a lot of people are not down on the flats necessarily. Um, uh, and, and Peter, I thought, I'm going to invite you to expand on this if you'd like, Peter, but I thought, you know, very, uh, yeah. yeah. And we, we definitely do recognize that. I know uh, throughout St. John, uh, north side of St. Thomas, many areas on St. Croix, um, we have very steep topography, narrow, windy roads. Um, in these areas, certainly installing a pedestrian facility is much more difficult. Um, you typically would require some kind of a retaining wall and drainage. And, but where we are reconstructing or doing major improvements in these areas, we will analyze these lo locations on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, you know, where we can justify um, making these improvements, um, we will certainly consider putting in facilities. But yeah, that, that, that is a tough challenge in, in many areas you find that just the pedestrians um, share the roadways with the vehicles um, and it, it can be dangerous, but um, it is something that we're looking at and, and there is a, a high cost associated with it. And, and right of way becomes an issue as well because the roadways are so narrow, um, properties abut the roadway fairly close. Um, even if we did have the funds, um, acquiring additional property can be, can be very difficult. Two things I'll add to that. I'll, we'll show some pictures in a few minutes here. And in those photos, I'm going to uh, uh, show you sort of some of the less expensive treatments that are being done with paint on very low volume roads. This isn't necessarily on a busy road. So it doesn't always necessarily mean expanding the pavement as, as a solution, or at least as a possible solution. Um, and um, I'll also, uh, I'll suggest that really relates to that land use and water, land and water use plan that was spoken about before, because this speaks to sort of where development happens and how it happens. Um, and, you know, sort of if we're going to be developing on hillsides, that's okay, um, but then you have to accommodate accordingly, right? You have to say, okay, what are we going to do? Because I've been in some very hilly communities that do great bicycle and pedestrian accommodation. Some of them are very urbanized areas like the, you probably heard Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington, which are both very hilly cities, but they're also really bicycle and pedestrian friendly cities because they've built it into the infrastructure. Harder to do in smaller communities, but I've been in some small communities in northern Vermont, for example, which are quite, quite have a lot of topography, and they've done a really good job of accommodating uh, bicyclists and pedestrians. But again, it starts with the presumption that the bicyclist and pedestrian are just as important as the car. It's woven in, which is sort of what the premise of a complete streets policy says. It says whenever we touch the road, we think about all the users, and and don't. Um, uh, don't only focus on the audible meal ex exclusively. Some folks are saying, by the way, Greg, that they're only getting uh, St. Croix, but not able to go to St. Thomas and St. John. And in fact, I just got a message that says I'm not licensed to go over there. I'm gonna try. <laughs> oh, that's odd. Um... Yeah. In other words, my St. Croix map's working fine. I I was able to, um, oh, yeah, it seems like St. John. St. Thomas is. Oh. Yeah, oh. I think maybe refresh your browser for those who have this issue. Um, my St. John was not working and I refreshed the browser and now it's working. Ah. So maybe refresh your browser. I was able Heck, to Elaine, uh, Elaine Mills, who's on, on the call, was talking about um, sort of, you know, sort of access to the various bays on St. John, Maho Bay, and Hawks Nest, and so on. And, and uh, so I hope, Elaine, you are identifying each of those. And, and if you somehow you cannot get on St. John, and I see a few points on St. John and Cruz Bay and Coral Bay, but if somehow you can't, well, all you can do is just scroll, like you go to St. Thomas and you just move your cursor, and the St. John map is going to show up. 
Oh, you could just go over there. You can just cross yeah, the, the tabs are just to kind of, you know, so you don't have take, to yeah, yeah, yeah. zoom out. So you take the ferry over. Just go you, right you across. Take the, you take the computer ferry, yes. Okay, got it. Good. Um, so I, I don't want to leave us too much longer doing that. I mean, I, I, we could do this perpetually, but I, I hope you now all understand it. Uh, let's make sure we do this. Does anybody have questions? Is anybody having difficulty? Because we want to, when we end today, you to know this tool is available and then continue to use it going forward. Um, Mark? Yeah. Kevin. Hi. Um, a few meetings back, I asked about the west end of the island. Yeah. And that's still a question as into, is there a plan in place where they can go walking? Yeah, that's a great question. Does anybody want to talk about the west end of the island and, and sort of walking opportunities there? Any effort underway that anybody knows? And you're you're talking about um, West End St. Croix? Yeah, yep. more along like that center line road, like the main road itself, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because in the West End area, um, people that walk usually leave west and come to the bypass or they use that beach access like all along where there's a Fred and there's um going towards the pool is usually what they used to walk at this moment. I, I know currently um public works is in the planning phase for doing um major improvements to the entire um Queen Mary center line from Frederickstead to Christiansted and that will include some um comprehensive uh, pedestrian and um, transit improvements. Uh, I know that um, Alma Winkfield and the um, Virgin Island Trail Alliance is making um, some progress with improving I know the, um, the trails that are come off of Scenic Road. Um, I know that's kind of in, in the mountain area on, on the on the west in, in, in the rainforest. I know that, that yeah, her, because... her, group, her group has gotten, I believe a grant to, um, to purchase some equipment for uh, trail clearing and maintenance. And they plan on uh, mm. expanding some of the, the trails in that area, which can be used for, for recreation. But That's we are- because yeah. currently um, I work out, I use a bypass. I use that, the road around five corners, going by the courthouse, go back around towards the old hospital pretty often through town. Um, I've done a couple of hikes. I've done the um, I've done the lighthouse hike. Tomorrow I'm doing the Blue Mountain hike. Never did that one before, but yeah, people are looking for things to do. Yeah, so I, I know certainly that there's there's some improvements in the near future coming from the Trail Alliance with regard to some trails off of Scenic Road, but um, and then some some major um, capital improvements to the pedestrian infrastructure, um, Queen Mary Center Line. Um, and, and in the town area of Frederickstead, but those are currently in the planning phase. So um, stay tuned. Um, you can visit um, Public Works website, dpw.bi.gov, and um, just stay in contact with the Walkability Institute and, and we'll provide updates. Certainly we'll have a, a public involvement element in all of these um, major capital improvement projects. We'll, we will reach out to the public to get input from them. Yeah, because um, besides our little meetings that we hold, the community is still kind of in the dark about walkability. I try to like tell them about every chance I get, like all oh, like those barrels by Sunny Isles. Yeah. People are clueless to what they are right now. Yeah. So, the, so I, I, I would right now direct them to the um, the Walkability Institute and their website. But then as, as soon as we get a little bit further in through the planning phase and actually in the design phase for some of these major recovery projects. Um, we are looking to do a, a, a complete streets approach to, to many of the, the larger recovery projects. And we will have a public involvement element in those. So um, the public will be available for, for comment. We'll probably have virtual town halls and, and if permitted regular town hall meetings to, um, to discuss these projects and, and how we uh, incorporate walkability into them. Okay, no problem. Thanks. 
I, I'm also going to propose uh, use this map, but right now I would love you yeah. to to to. I was going to go to the Queen Mary Highway right now, and I was going to put a thing about one of those interest Absolutely. points on it. Please, you know, because what'll happen is I guarantee Peter and Greg and, and the team will take a look at this too to sort of see if it triggers any ideas that were missed in a public meeting or so on. So so don't hesitate, Kevin, to to identify a couple of those locations you just mentioned where you're going hikes and so on. I think I was I was scrolling around the Frederickstead there and trying to see, okay, are those are those identified yet? And if not, boy, it'd be great to drop them onto the map right yeah, now. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I will. I will certainly. Use... Can you hear me, Mark? Now you're back. Yep. Sorry, Peter. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah, I, I will certainly use this map and um, wherever we are, we're planning projects or um, and if we have locations that are within project limits, I'll, I'll take that into consideration. Great. Well, Mark, um, the, the, the four major hike sites right now on Island, the hotspots are the, um, the lighthouse. Blue Mountain, um, out of Anali Bay, that's, um, that's off the of Tide Pool. Yeah. And the one, the different ones out at um, Christmas Park out there by, um, at the end of the island there. Yeah, they, they, they have a lot of people going to the other yeah. weekend. So ID each of those because we also have to think about sort of access to those, right? Is the only way to get to those locations to hike or could you ride your bike there? Could you, you know, eventually, you know, we have communities. Um, most of them are, <laughs> yeah, you got to go on foot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because because what I was going to say is um, we have communities that as they build a comprehensive trail pan for the community, their goal is to make, they, this is the word now, get this, your front door is your trailhead. So the idea being that you walk out your front door and then you can use on-street pathways and so on to get then to a trailhead that might take you to an off-road trail or something like that, or, you, or, a, or a bike path, um, something. I'm not saying that, you know, the, the, the territory is there yet, but that could be an eventual goal, right, to yeah, kind of connect I, the I, network. I did I did a tie pool like once and I did it by horseback. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so, so yeah, so please be identifying those on the map. So you know what I'm going to do uh, with, with everybody's permission, I'm going to, I'm going to take back control, Greg. Um, I'm seeing, we're seeing stuff pop up. Yes. People are actually taking advantage of this. Uh, uh, jo Joanne Luciano just said walking out the door and up is what I do regularly. So she goes out the door and then goes vertical. Great, Joanne, that's your role modeling the very behavior we're looking for. All right, so um, if I may, I'm gonna retake control and finish up with, by showing some pictures of um, that you guys submitted. A number of people submitted stuff ahead of time. I won't possibly do justice to them, but I just wanted to have a little fun with this um, because, oops, that's the wrong one. I'm gonna try this, sorry. My apologies. It'll take me one second to bring it up. Okay, there it is. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, and some of you just sort of sent in a couple of photos and some, uh, a handful, Elaine Mills put in a whole bunch from St. John, which I really appreciated. We won't, again, we won't be able to do justice. So somebody just nod and confirm my screen. Photo voice pictures is up there now, right? Yep, yep. okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, I think Julian Henley suggested these. Julian, are you are you on per chance? Uh, so he works uh, around accessibility uh, and ADA. Mark, Mark, this is Desiree. It's Miss Julius with uh, FEMA. I oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, great. I, I just missed who had sent them. So um, these are photos. Uh, and what was interesting to me, the, the brilliance of this, this was to point out this is the road, the other roadways that connect to where the Department of Human Services is on St. Thomas. And she points out, you know, you're talking the Head Start office, nursing, senior assisted living, a senior center, the SNAP program, Medicaid office. So all of this stuff is in an area where it could well be people who need pedestrian access, right? People who are not necessarily driving. Um, and, and so when we think about prioritizing pedestrian accommodation, um, this is exactly the kind of a, of a location, Department of Human Services, where you would want to assure that, right? And I know these are these are old roads, and you know they, they they're sort of reflecting their age and when they were constructed. Uh, so we totally get that, um, but it does sort of help set priorities and help us think about okay, should this be a priority area for for infrastructure improvement over time? Anybody want to add anything or make an observation or suggestion? Yeah, I, I think this is, this is a, a great location that has lots of opportunity. I, I travel through here a lot. This is in hospital ground. Um, and there are a lot of pedestrians and they walk in the roadway. They're out in the road. They're out in the road. 
It does look to me like there might be enough right of way, though, to at least allocate a pedestrian space on one side or the other. Maybe, Peter. But yeah, you're, 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 there's there's certainly opportunities to to do something, but it is challenging. And then there's a this is the area of the stadium as well. The, ah. In the middle picture to the right, that's the the wall of the stadium. Oh, right here. OK, got it. Yep. Oh, sorry to the left. Sorry to the left. Oh, you're saying right along here? Wall. Yes, that's. Yeah. Oh, that's the edge. Okay. Yeah. So um, there is certainly a lot of some improvements and there's a, a, a lot of destinations and as well as um, major housing development and, and high density residential areas. So see, and, and high density residential means you've got those, every one of those households is a candidate pedestrian if we make it safe and inviting for them, right? And then that means it's one less car trip. Every time somebody who lives close enough to walk to a destination does do so, it's one less car we're dealing with on the road, one less car we have to park. So big win there. Cool. Um, so Tonya Garnett, uh, I'm, my apologies if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, submitted a handful um, of photos. So this was kids being active, which in just sort of a public space, which is really what you love to see. And, and this alludes to a little bit of what um, uh, Greg was talking about with the notion of community cohesion, creating spaces where people interact, obviously, you know, sort of creates the incidental opportunity for in interaction, right? This isn't even necessarily a playground, it's just a space, but, but if I come upon others there, uh, uh, then, then I might have the chance to say hello or, you know, and connect and get to know a neighbor or whatever. Um, she also shared these cool photos of people being physically active along Veterans Drive, uh, and and then the, the secret was out. It was actually a family out exercising. She said this was actually a, a crew. Um, Ms. Garnett, are, are you on the call per chance? Did you say anything else about these images? I'm just waiting to give her time to unmute if she wants to. I can just add that, um, you know, the waterfront has exploded in popularity mm -hmm. and it is, it is just, you know, you build it and, and, and they will come. It, it was just gonna, that's why I added this photo to say, you know, there's a serious investment had to go in to do this, right? Um, but, 40, go ahead. 40 something million dollars for a, um, a section of roadway that's about a thousand feet. So yeah. it, it is costly. And it's still under, um, still under construction. So in this area, you will see shade trees, as well as um, benches and additional lighting. So it really. Oh, oh, that's still to come, Peter. You're saying oh, the yeah, shade it's still under construction? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. The final it's... landscaping has not been installed. So what's brilliant about that is, despite that, people are already out. Clearly, right? Okay. Yes. That's great. Very very popular. Good. This is what our elected officials and decision makers and policy makers and our partners in FEMA and everywhere else, we all have to keep reminding ourselves, it does work when we do it well. Yeah, love those photos. So I appreciate the, the sending those. Now this, uh, um, Ms. Ross, I think sent this of, um, I don't know precisely where, but the implication in the note with the photo was people do use this as a, as a walking route. Can anybody clarify or identify where this is? All right, well, let me make a, a quick point about this. This is a very narrow road. It looks like it may not be much traffic volume. It might be very slow. Would we necessarily spend to create a sidewalk here if it's very rural and there's not many destinations? Perhaps not. I, um, there is a guidebook that I have been using. By the way, somebody's unmuted and we're getting background noise. So please mute if you're not talking right now. I just wanna point out that um, this route might be the kind of road where you might use some of the things that are identified in the Federal Highways Small Town and Rural Multimodal Network Guide. It may not, by the way. I'm only I using- that's, that's, a, that's a great application for that. That certainly would work in that kind of an area. Okay, Peter, that, that's reassuring to me. I was gonna ask you to sort of vet that. Um, so here's the theory. Here's where you're using paint to create maybe a painted edge line and just a pedestrian lane, just on one side of the road or these are called advisory shoulders. So here the idea is if it's a low speed, low, low volume road, you could paint a dashed line along one edge, call it a shoulder, but acknowledge that when traffic needs to, it can move into the shoulder. So here I'm driving in the, in the primary lane and I've left the edge so that a pedestrian or a bicyclist can be in it. But when I have to pass another vehicle, then I slide into the advisory shoulder. Um, 
good for potentially roads, my apologies, uh, without much traffic. So you're not gonna have a lot of conflicts. You define that space by the way, and you tend to bring speeds down. Sometimes creating an edge, right, with paint will actually slow the traffic a little bit by defining sort of where they're supposed to be. Um, so, and the reason I mentioned this is because that's a reasonably inexpensive. You know, we, we're not gonna be, we're only gonna be able to do so many $40 million projects. But this kind of stuff um, is, is potentially feasible price-wise. However, and let's be clear on this, once you paint it, you have to maintain it. To do that well, it's gotta be repainted every couple of years. So we have to acknowledge that we would wanna build in to our thinking what the maintenance uh, costs would be uh, as well as the initial in uh, infrastructure. Greg or Peter wanna add anything to that? Okay, I'm just, uh, I'm planting I think you seeds. covered it pretty well. Yeah, I'm planting seeds, right? So that we're thinking creatively about low cost solutions too, not just, and then, and then these are these great slides that uh, images that Elaine, Elaine, I'm not doing justice to all that you submitted, but you really talked about the importance of, for example, Cruise Bay, of course, um, you know, when I, when one of the times I visited, I came in on the ferry right here. And so I knew just what you were talking about, sort of it's a highly um, sort of uh, pedestrian, uh, th there's a lot going on. It's an area of commerce. It's a area of arrival. It's an, um, um, and yet, you know, um, you can see lots of this kind of stuff, either old sidewalks and steps that are in poor repair um, and or challenging, or they would be a real challenge for somebody with a disability, right, in a wheelchair using a cane. Um, and then you're talking about the walk toward Cruise Bay Harbor here. Um, um, and it's funny because to, in, there's a part of me and, and I, I'm really asking you guys this, that this feels to me like it is already a pedestrianized zone just because everything's so close together and dense. There's a lot of pedestrian activity. A am I right in remembering it that way? Yes. And what the, the, the sidewalks and the pedestrian facilities are lacking, but because of the low volumes and low speeds, people walk in the street and right. it works fairly well. Right. But it, it, it is because of the historic nature, the hills, and the, um, the right-of-way constraints private property, it is really difficult to build a proper sidewalk. So it begs the question whether some creative treatments, you remember things like using paint and vertical delineators to perhaps, perhaps create, you know, edges and so on um, without, without digging up a lot of concrete and asphalt and, and maybe in key locations putting in uh, a curb ramp that helps with accessibility or something like that. Um, without doing a wholesale tearing up of the road. I, I wonder whether this might be an area that would be well suited to something of a pedestrian plan around that. And, and here Elaine points out, very, you know, here it is as a visitor welcome point in a main shopping district. So this is the kind of place we should get right. And then I'm gonna add one last topic because it's an area of, of some real recent activity. Uh, uh, Mr. Henley had shared some photos from this event when they laid out the, the, the I think very recently, fairly recently, uh, the pedestrian, the kind of the rollout pedestrian pathway uh, to access the, um, the water here, the access map. Um, and uh, uh, there's a wonderful picture of this woman in the water, a huge grin on her face using one of the, I think this, this, this very device um, to be able to be in the water. Uh, through, because of the accessibility provided through, by this equipment and by the mat. Um, and I think, you know, the challenge that Elaine was saying, should we be thinking about other locations, Hawks Nest Bay, uh, Maho Bay, um, um, for, for similar accommodation? Um, uh, yeah, so I just, uh, again, and, and she did a really nice job. There, there's a there's some notes that we'll upload to the site that everybody's welcome to look at with, with even more photos and more of these great notes that she included. So they'll all be on that site that we'll upload that Greg uh, recommended earlier. Thoughts, questions, comments, additions? Because otherwise, I'm going to close with a couple of quick points here as we close in on, yes, 1.30. Here it is, or 2.30 for you, right? So I would ask everybody to be talking anytime you have the opportunity about the inclusion of pedestrian, bicycle, and transit access and facilities in everything that we do. In other words, it should be brought to our, when we're doing housing development work, we should be thinking about it during any, any disaster recovery, response, reconstruction, routine, just routine paving, you know, sort of it can, it can be on all of our, our radar. I think local and territorial officials 
I really have to hear this message. Now, um, I, this was mentioned in the chat and I'm gonna reiterate it. There was AARP led the charge, but many of you were involved in getting complete streets legislation passed by the legislature, but then it was vetoed by the governor. My understanding and others on the call, maybe I'll add more, but from the folks I've spoken to, the concern was cost, that adding pedestrian and bike facilities might be cost burdensome if we make it a requirement because we now have legislation. Um, I, I hope we have made the case today that not everything has to necessarily be burdensome. There will certainly be places where bicycle and pedestrian accommodation is costly, but it's not always the case. And more importantly, um, I think we've made the case today that there are enough reasons to do it that we have to figure out ways to pay for it because simply accommodating motor vehicles leaves us with an awful lot of problems, whether it's public health, environmental health, and I would argue economic health. So I hope that that complete streets legislation is not dead and the voices on this call could make the difference. So this is a personal plea from Mark. This is not an official petition, of, by the way, the Centers for Disease Control, I'm not allowed to do that. But I can tell you as somebody who does this work all over the country, it is worth getting that legislation passed and signed by the governor. Um, uh, and I am ecstatic to hear about this pending land use, land and water use plan. And I think that we should make a large and collective effort to bring all of the sensibilities we've talked about today to that. And one of the ways communities are doing that with effect, so I'm gonna leave you with this thought, is to create something like a standing active transportation advisory committee, ATAC, um, is a, an acronym you see a lot, or a bicycle pedestrian advisory committee, but active transportation automatically includes transit too normally. Um, I think you're ready for that. I think by the, the quality of the conversation and the people I've been meeting and the work you guys are doing, it might be appropriate to try to come up with a, um, a way to form such a committee. It would be great if it were government sanctioned and sort of reported to the governor, to legislature and made recommendations, or you might have one per island. I would defer to your thoughts on how to do it best. Um, but it would also, I mean, in many ways, I think it would make Peter's life easier, not harder, at, because it would be voices of support when he's making recommendations like the ones he often makes, if there were a, a committee, a group, an interdisciplinary group adding and voice to that. I'll take a breath, ask for comments, additional closing thoughts. Greg, any final plea from you? No. Um... This was very, very um, informative for me. Um, so thank you for having me um, and thanks for your presentation. I hope that the exercise was fun and I thought, I hope that um, you learned a lot um, listening to the three of us. Um, really looking forward to all the great initiatives that uh, Pete mentioned and uh, really looking for integration of walking, biking and other mode of transportation into our daily routine because it makes us stronger. So thank you so much. Thank Absolutely. you, Greg. This is, this is Kathleen from the Department of Health. I just want to say gracious thank you to all the participants and to our panel. The panel, amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Desiree Ross in the background for all you've done and Margot and everybody else involved. But I really appreciate the fact that we have been able to get this far and really make some movement with all the barriers and all the uh, the challenges we had definitely made some progress, and I'm glad to be at this point part of the Walkability Institute. I'm happy that uh, we were able to do this. So thank you very much to all. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Valman from the Department of Health. On behalf of the commissioner, definitely extending sincere thanks to the teams. Kathleen, you have been at this with the team from the very beginning. And I just want to be very, you know, express the, the support from the department to continue the efforts to get that legislation passed. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Valman. I'm so appreciative. You have been a great supporter all the way through too, and, and we so value it. Thanks. Everybody, thank you so much. We've kept you for a full hour and a half plus some, and you have given us so much. And please continue to use the mapping tool and, 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 and upload those photos. Know that they're part of an archive that we hope is the archive of change, positive change. Thank you so, so much. Where do you upload the photos to? Um, uh, oh, boy. The, 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 that link was also... It's in